So first off, I just want to start by saying that please do not mistake this for the five easy steps to make everything perfect in your home, during probably one of the top 10 most stressful times in history. <laughs> um, there is no perfect in this situation. So many are in impossible situations, balancing work, balancing home life um, in ways that we've never really had to do before. So really, please uh, <laughs> don't mistake this as a way to be able to walk away and everything's going to be sunshine and rainbows. Um, I know that's definitely not the case in my home, but we're all just doing the best we can. And I think being able to give yourself and each other grace through the situation and learning some practical steps to um, relate with each other is going to be hopefully a beneficial outcome of this time. Um, and then I just want to remind you as well that praise God that we have a God who can silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, and the tumult of the peoples. I think in a lot of ways we're experiencing that right now. And what a gift and what a blessing it is for us to be able to rely on a God who can bring that peace to us in a way that nothing else can. Um, okay, so I want to uh, talk about some common causes of stress in children, adolescents, in just any time. Um, major changes in life, including divorce, death in a family, moving, or addition of a new sibling can be something that can cause stress. Parental instability, um, you know, changes that come with divorce or a parent that might be in and out of their lives. Overly packed or unpredictable schedules can also cause stress. Um, interactions with peers, especially through the developmental stages. Um, and just as a, kind of an aside, like I said, we have a great amount of variety of um, attendance today, which is wonderful. So I am going to try to hit preschool age needs and concerns, um, adolescent needs and concerns, and also that school age kind of middle, um, upper elementary and tween age. So to kind of make sure that we are hitting those three major aspects of the developmental stages um, to try to be most relevant to everyone that is um, here today. Um, okay, so interaction with peers, again, depending on the, the uh, developmental stage. Independence and mastery. So especially in that tween and teen stage, so much of what they're struggling to do is just figuring out what they can do on their own and how they can masterfully do that. Um, and then catastrophic events on the news and exposure to, to scary movies or books. So those are causes of stress that happen regardless of what's going on in the world, just common. Now we're thinking about currently the situation that we're in today with COVID-19, um, the pandemic, and then all of the other kind of ripple effects that come from that. So I think so much of the stress that so many people are experiencing might not be only due to specifically the illness of COVID-19, but the um, ramifications of stay-at-home orders, instability in jobs, and so many other things. So we're just going to kind of look at some of those, um, a few of those causes, and I'm sure we're all living it, so this isn't anything that's new or uh, <laughs> mind-blowing. Um, our kids are dealing with major changes in schooling methods, expectation environments. If you have a kid who may have already been struggling in school, um, the transitions that so many of them have experienced over the last few months really are an indicator and a cause of stress. Um, sudden and unexpected changes in schedule. Um, you know, maybe you were planning on making a big trip to Disney or doing something fun or visiting with family and suddenly those things are no longer available. Um, loss of time with extended family, friends, and caring adults. I think it's easy as a parent or a caregiver to forget how many other loving adults are in their lives. Um, friendly teachers, a bus driver that asks them how they're doing, um, coaches, and um, other Sunday school teachers, adults that are in their lives that add to that filling their cup that the parents primarily do, but they're missing out on those um, extra people that pour into them throughout the day. A loss of extra activities, um, you know, for a lot of kids being involved in a sport, karate, or other um, dance, things like that, it gives them physical input, it gives them exercise, it gives them uh, socialization, and they're missing out on so many of those things. Um, there are many families that are dealing with loss of loved ones, whether it be from COVID-19 or from other reasons. 
Um, but in this current season, when we lose a loved one, we're not often able to grieve and have connection with family and friends like we might normally. And so kids feel that stress as well. Um, also, you know, probably a high likelihood and varying degrees depending on the household, but increased stress at home. Um, due to external pressure. So, you know, shifts in jobs, finances, where parents concern and worry, you know, our kids pick up on that stress that we bring into the home for a variety of reasons. Um, and then a lot of our kids, as they hear things about COVID-19, they might have a lot of fears about illness for themselves or for family members. I know um, myself, I have three kids, a 10-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a three-year-old, and my 10-year-old runs down the checklist of symptoms of COVID-19 every time she talks to one of her grandparents. Um, and, you know, in some ways it's, you kind of chuckle about it because it's sweet and kind, but at the same time, that weight and pressure on a 10-year-old to be needing to diagnose her grandparents because she's fearful that they might become ill, um, you know, just kind of speaks to that added level of stress that so many of our kids are under due to the circumstances currently. So I want to talk a little bit about common reactions to stress. These might be behaviors that you're seeing in your kids um, at home or kids that you're working with. And it's important to recognize that depending on the developmental stage, there are some pretty common and reasonable um, behaviors that you might see in kids that is a reaction to stress. And so I think sometimes getting caught up in the day-to-day, -day, it can be easy to miss why some of these things might be happening, um, but it's good to know where the cause might be. So if you have a preschooler at home or through work, um, some of the things that you might see is an increase in separation anxiety or even a fear of being alone. So that might happen um, if, you know, you're putting them to bed and it's time to stay in their own bed and you need to leave, or if somebody in the household maybe needs to leave for a little bit, um, I know for my kids who are a little more spread out across the developmental stages, um, when it's time for me to go to the grocery store, you'd think I was moving to Antarctica. Um, and that's not usually the circumstances in our home, but just because of so many things shifting and changing, that even sometimes that little extra separation that needs to happen for just a grocery store run can be distressing because they're already carrying that stress throughout the day. Um, for preschoolers, you might see a regression in potty training or bedwetting. Um, a lot of times, just those developmental regressions take place as a result of stress. Complaints of stomach aches, changes in appetite, um, and definitely an increase in temper tantrum, whining, and clingy behaviors. I can say uh, an anecdotal study of friends with young kids, um, this is definitely something that's really common right now. And it's for so many reasons, but um, the stress that's taking place it affects even our youngest kids. Um, if you have school-age kids at home, some things that you might be noticing is an increase in irritability, whining, or even aggressive behaviors, um, being a little more clingy to a caregiver, nightmares, sleep, or appetite disturbances. This can happen from stress, and then it can be compounded with the fact that a lot of us are kind of off schedule, um, and life is just a little less structured than it normally is. Um, physical symptoms like headaches and stomach aches can show up in school age kids as well, um, as well as maybe a competition for attention from caregivers in the home. Um, you might see in your school age kids some forgetfulness or trouble focusing as well, as that stress just kind of takes up some of that brain energy that they might be using towards, you know, being more responsible with something like schoolwork or chores. If you have teens at home, some things that you might be seeing, again, the physical symptoms, a lot of times for, I think, kids across the, across the age gamut, there are those physical symptoms um, that express the emotional stress they're feeling. Sleep and appetite disturbances, agitation, or a decrease in energy. So you might see a kid that's just pretty apathetic and not really interested in doing much of anything. Um, you might see them pushing back against some new boundaries and expectations. Um, you know, maybe they're not too interested in wearing a mask if they had to go somewhere or not really understanding why they can't be physically with their friends during this time. You might see them isolating from peers or loved ones, spending a lot of time in their room, just away from everybody. And sometimes that stress can kind of lead to even some depression or 
um, just leave me feeling a little overstimulated. Avoiding schoolwork um, is another one that, uh, you know, can often happen with kids, especially adolescents, when they're just feeling a little overwhelmed um, and maybe struggling to focus in the same way that some of the younger kids might be. It might just be easier to kind of forget the schoolwork. I know in talking to some high school teachers too, a lot of students um, were not really prepared to make that transition to um, a workload that was a lot more um, requiring for them to be self-motivated and on their own. And they just kind of feel overwhelmed by this huge pile of schoolwork that they all of a sudden have to get done in the day and structure themselves to complete. Um, so, you know, if you have an adolescent who is avoiding schoolwork, they might need a little bit more support or prompting in maybe making a list of the schoolwork that they have to do, starting with whatever the easiest is. So you can kind of start crossing stuff off that list and they can kind of feel that sense of accomplishment and feel um, and gain momentum in breaking down that list of schoolwork. Um, you know, a lot of times we think, oh, our older teens might be fine and they can just kind of jump on their schoolwork the way they do with homework. But I think for, for kids all of a sudden, dealing with this additional stress and then having this newfound um, almost independence completely with their schoolwork, it could be a little overwhelming for them and lead to some avoidance. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is just some basics about understanding the brain um, and especially the brain as it relates to stress. Um, there's a great organization um, that has a, a program out called the Stoplight Approach. They're a Christian organization out of Canada and they have just such a great way of framing this understanding of the brain and ways that you can support um, children who might be experiencing some emotional um, distress. There, here's their website, um, this is the stoplightapproach.org. I would definitely encourage you to look into them if this is something that interests you or you want some more information. They do have a few books available. Um, and I, I just think they have a great way of framing things for both teachers and parents if this is something you wanna learn a little more about. Um, so the basic understanding from the stoplight approach how it's framed is that the green brain is the cortical the cortical brain which is kind of the highest level thinking that takes place in your brain um, so the green brain if you're thinking of a stoplight that's go they're ready to learn and we'll talk a little bit more about each each aspect of the brain the yellow brain is the limbic system um, it's the emotional brain on high alert so kind of understanding that you know there could be a time when your child is in this yellow brain area and what that looks like for them. And then the red brain is the brain stem or the survival mode brain. Um, this is really the most basic um, instincts that God has given us to keep us safe. Uh, but there are times when that gets activated when things aren't truly um, unsafe. And so understanding what those behaviors look like and then also um, how you can intervene during that time. So we're gonna kind of break this down a little further. The, the red brain, like I said, we start from the bottom because this is how the brain develops. So um, the brain stem develops in utero first. That's the first part of the brain that develops, and it's the survival mode brain. Um, that is where all the instincts related to fight, flight, and freeze are. And so when a person is in that survival brain mode, in that red brain, they are often kind of will act out in one of three ways that relate to fight, flight, or freeze in order to keep them safe from a dangerous situation. And this can happen even when um, it's not truly a dangerous situation, but when their brain is perceiving it as that. This is great when you need to be kept alive when you're in danger. So there is a reason and a purpose that God created this element of our brain. It's when it kind of goes to the side <laughs> when, uh, when we need to address it differently. And in this, in the red brain, you're really only using about 50% of your IQ. Um, so this isn't the time when you're able to understand critical thinking, when you're able to make good decisions, or when you're able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Really what it is, is that your ultimate need in this time is that you need to feel safe. Behavior in red brain is often angry, defiant, running away, tuning out, or becoming unresponsive. Again, this kind of behavioral fleshing out of fight, flight, or freeze. This person can't really think clearly, problem solve, or see others' perspectives. 
and they're likely feeling unsafe and overwhelmed. The caregiver of a child who's in red brain might find themselves feeling embarrassed, angry, powerless, desperate for control, or like a failure. I think most parents, if they're honest, you know, if you're that parent who's, <laughs> whose kid is having a huge temper tantrum in the middle of a grocery store, um, your feelings are probably a little less empathetic with whatever they're dealing with at that time and a little more um, self-focused, feeling embar embarrassed or frustrated or powerless or trying to figure out any way to control the situation. But in, um, to be honest, and we'll talk about this a little more, that often leads to the caregiver joining them in red brain rather than being able to um, help them regulate. And so we'll, we'll continue to talk about that. And as we see this, I want you to think about both your children and, and ourselves as caregivers. So it's important to understand our own um, neurological expression of stress and frustration and anger and feelings of unsafety, of feeling unsafe or overwhelmed. Um, and also recognizing that in our children as much. So if we're not able to regulate ourselves, we're not gonna be able to help them regulate. The yellow brain, as we said before, is the limbic system. That's your emotional brain on high alert. This develops around nine months, and it's really great for advocating or protecting others. It's that mama bear instinct where, you know, there might come a time when you feel that emotion rise up in you to say, hey, that is not okay. Um, and I think that plays an important role, but in the wrong situation, it's something that can prevent you or your child um, from learning, growing, using um, critical thinking skills. In yellow brain, you're using about 75% of your potential IQ. And in this time, an individual needs to feel um, valued and connected. That's really the most important thing um, for them at this time. Behavior in yellow brain can often be irritable, unfocused. Their learning ability is diminished and it might take longer. Um, so they do have some ability to, to learn, but it is um, a little bit slowed down. And they're feeling unsafe, tired, sick, hungry, stressed, frustrated, and ashamed. I cannot tell you how many times um, we have been working on school at home in our new, new normal of online homeschooling, um, and we're you know, plugging away, doing pretty well. And then all of a sudden, one of my kids just hits a wall and it seems so grumpy and so um, uncooperative. And I'm just like, what's the matter with you? <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this. Um, and then all of a sudden I'll look at the time and think, oh my gosh, it's 1245. Like you need to eat lunch. You're feeling hungry. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, being able to kind of play into those cues and understand if you see a kid all of a sudden just that learning is slowing, they're irritable, they're unfocused, it's like, okay, take a step back. Is something happening that they're feeling unsafe? They're feeling tired, sick, hungry, stressed, or frustrated. And what do we need to do to kind of change things up? The caregiver in this situation might feel frustrated, worried, or disrespected. And so like in the example that I shared, there are definitely times where I was feeling so frustrated and wondering why on earth they couldn't just finish this one more assignment to get things done. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're probably starving and need lunch. Um, okay, so the green brain is cortical brain. This is the thinking and learning brain. This is where you're on task, you're able to, um, I should say, able to have, uh, put yourself in other people's shoes, have empathy, and also 100% of your IQ is being used. The cortical brain isn't fully developed until around age 25. So our hopes and dreams of our <laughs> preschoolers, even school age and even adolescents, being fully on task all the time, fully in that green brain, is probably a little unrealistic since it's not really fully developed until age 25. This is great for just living life and learning, being able to have healthy connections and know people around you. The behavior is focused, cooperative, willing to take initiative. You can learn new things with maximum effectiveness, and you're able to problem solve, plan ahead, use critical thinking, and reflect on yourself and situations. So it's important to note here is that all of these things that you can do in green brain are things that you cannot do in red or yellow brain. So if somebody is, 
you know, if your school age child is really at their wits end, having a tantrum, they're not gonna be able to problem solve, use critical thinking, or reflect on themselves or the situation. That's just not a part of their brain that is at all able to access. That green brain disconnects completely when you're in red brain. And so none of those um, skills are able to be accessed until the child or the adult is able to regulate um, to kind of regain access to that higher level thinking. Um, and then when you have a child in green brain, the, the caregiver is often proud, safe, and respected. So I just wanna take a minute to talk about the window of tolerance. Um, so basically the window of tolerance is a person's ability to stay in green brain. Um, and this varies from child to child, from adult to adult. If you have a child that has already experienced trauma, um, chances are their window of tolerance is much smaller than another child might be. If you have a child that has experienced anxiety or depression prior to this situation, chances are, again, that window of tolerance is much smaller. So it's gonna take a smaller trigger to push them outside of that. And being pushed outside of that window of tolerance is what puts you into yellow or red brain. So if you imagine the little um, person sitting Indian style in the middle of that box, in the middle of that window of tolerance is the one who's comfortably within that green brain. Um, but then the other ones, the further they are outside of that, window, um, the more likely it is that they're in yellow or red brain. Um, part of what's important in staying in our own window of tolerance is recognizing triggers. So both triggers for ourselves and for our children. If you um, understand behaviors that just every time, if your child does this certain thing, it's going to put you over the edge. It's important that you have a plan to kind of keep yourself within that window of tolerance um, so that you can respond to your child in a way that helps them be able to maintain that window of tolerance themselves. When you're in that window of tolerance, that's really where a child is able to learn, to love and be loved the best. Um, also notice and communicate their own emotions and the emotions of other people. So that's why we kind of want to think about maintaining that kind of healthy green area as much as possible for both ourselves and our children and being able to have a plan set in place for what can happen when um, that they're pushed outside that window. Okay, so <clears throat> um, this image is from Beacon House. Um, they're just a great uh, resource for a lot of things relating to um, trauma, relating to stress in the brain for both children and adults. Um, also, Dr. Bruce Perry wrote a book called Reaching the Learning Brain, and a lot of this information is um, taken from that resource as well. On the very final page of this uh, PowerPoint presentation, I listed out some of the resources if you want further information or just to kind of know what, where some of this information is coming from. There's a good bit of things that you can um, connect to there. So the idea here is, like I said before, we're always working from red brain up through yellow to green. And so the way to do that is you start first with regulating, then you can move to relate and then to reason. If we jumped right into reasoning with a child who is in the middle of fight or flight or freeze, you're not gonna be able to get very far. So um, for instance, you know, maybe with your own child or in a classroom setting, you've seen a kid having a temper tantrum. And if you're trying to explain to them in the middle of that tantrum, all you have to do is three more math problems and then everything is gonna be fine and they just continue to lay on the ground screaming. <laughs> um, or if you have a toddler who just completely falls out for something that doesn't really make a lot of sense, like maybe you gave them the cup that was the wrong color and they're on the ground explaining to them that their juice is gonna taste the same in the blue cup as it would in the green cup, isn't gonna get you very far if they're stuck in that red blink red brain. So reasoning isn't really something that you can access in red or even yellow. So we kind of walk through these skills, um, starting with regulating and then moving up through the yellow brain and having um, a connected and attuned relationship with a child. And then they can move into reason. And then that's where you can learn, ref reflect, um, and articulate some of those that emotional experience in a better way. <clears throat> so we're going to kind of work through that um, 
step by step, and I'm going to try to share with you some specific um, specific skills that you can help with your child. So in the red brain, our goal is to regulate. The primary need is to feel safe. So this is not the time to problem solve, teach new things, or try to reason, like we said. Some of the things that are helpful are top-down reassurances. So what that means is you as a parent, caregiver, teacher, you can give them messages that they might not be sure of. So if they're feeling unsafe, it's important that you tell them things like, you're safe, you're not in trouble, I'm not mad, if those things are true. <laughs> so part of that, again, is making sure that you as the adult are regulated um, so that you're not angry and screaming and then can come back to help them come to a place of regulation and talk about that they're safe, they're not mad. Um, preparing yourself and having a script for when you feel like saying, stop crying. Um, I know, I think maybe many parents, I'm assuming I'm not alone, when you felt frustrated or overwhelmed with child, a child's behavior and there's a part of you that just kind of rises up inside, you're dysregulated and red brain and you wanna just say, stop crying. Um, but instead, if you give yourself a script ahead of time as that caregiver to kind of have those phrases that you can say that are gonna to move towards regulation for that child, instead of something like stop crying, that's gonna keep them in that red brain feeling unsafe. Um, so you can say things like, it's okay to be sad. I'm here with you. That was really scary, disappointing, upsetting. I'll help you work it out. Or if it seems like the more you talk to them, the worse they get, you can say something like, it looks like you need some space to work it out. I'm gonna stay close so you can find me when you're ready. So that they know you're not um, sending them away because they're experiencing emotions but you're also giving them some space, but letting them know you're nearby when they need you. Um, sensory experiences can also be something that really helps with regulating. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about some options um, with sensory experiences. Um, I'm gonna, one of the references at the end is to a program called Mendability, and they offer sensory enrichment therapy, but they've done some really interesting studies about um, sensory experiences and its effect on the brain. So one of the um, studies that they did showed that touch and a, a pleasant smell together um, increases norepinephrine in the brain and an increase in norepinephrine helps to increase attention, mood regulation and brain plasticity, which is basically the brain's ability to change and grow. Um, so simple things like giving your child a hand massage with um, a nice smelling lotion can be something that's calming. Let me just back up for a second and say this. So the regulation, these regulation activities that we're talking about, um, they can be used in a moment when a child is in red brain um, or is in, you know, in that brain stem behavior, or you can use them periodically throughout the day um, maybe when you see a little bit of kind of yellow brain behavior or just if you know your child tends to have that kind of easy trigger, this is a time that's very stressful for a lot of families. So you can integrate these regulation activities throughout the day just to kind of keep everybody in green brain. It doesn't always have to be just in response to behaviors that seem um, frustrating or difficult. So they can be used kind of preemptively as well as in response to um, difficult behavior. So, you know, you can be creative with touch and smell together, as long as it's something that they enjoy the smell of, it can be, um, it's fine. So, you know, I've had families that I worked with who their child just like really enjoyed fresh oranges. So they would let them have that touch and they would kind of like feel the outside of the skin and talk about like, wow, that's bumpy and I can feel this. And then peel away the orange peel, take a big bite of the orange and then smell it say, what does it smell like today? Is it a good smell? And just kind of um, sort of sinking into that sensory experience. Um, I've had other families who have really enjoyed, and if you're crafty and go on Pinterest, you can find lots of recipes, but enjoy uh, making scented Play-Doh. So then you can just use Play-Doh and have fun, but then there's also that positive scent along with it um, that kind of, again, increases norepinephrine in the brain. So you can really be creative with that as long as it's a, a sensory experience that the child enjoys and you're comfortable with it, then it's fine. Um, moving muscle groups, big hugs, weighted blankets, trampolines, swings, 
you know, I know most of us were stuck at home. So what you have at home, you have to be creative. Um, but those sensory experiences of really moving big muscle groups is helpful. Um, one way that you can kind of be creative with things at home is using painter's tape to make a sensory walkway. So uh, painter's tape, you could get at the dollar store. If you stick it down on the floor, it'll come right back up um, without leaving residue usually. Um, so things that you can do is kind of make lines for them, like they can walk along a balance beam with a stuffed animal on their head. Um, you can have them with you or with siblings pass a ball over their head or under their legs, um, doing push-ups, jumping jacks, and heavy work is something that can be really um, calming to a lot of kids. And so thinking like anything that's heavy, so whatever's age appropriate for your child, but um, something that my kids love to do is take turns pulling each other around on a blanket, <laughs> swinging them around throughout the house. Um, so just that energy, getting that energy out and that heavy work of pulling um, somebody around on a blanket, stacking up couch cushions, or for older kids, household jobs, that can really kind of give that sensory input that has an overall calming effect on the brain. Um, and I'll show you on the next slide a couple of pictures of some of those things. Music and art together can have a really calming effect um, and an emotional regulation effect as well. You can use it as a transition. So, um, you know, maybe if you kind of have a morning of schoolwork and then we're transitioning to lunch or a time where, you know, everybody gets kind of grumpy, like it seems like that like half an hour to an hour before dinner time with a lot of families I've worked with can be a tricky time. So using um, music and art as a way to kind of have a better transition into that time where typically, you know, your kids might be a little more dysregulated. Um, the brain actually has a beauty center in it, a part of the brain that recognizes and responds to things that are beautiful. And I think that's just such a, um, just a wonderful gift from God that he's given us that, you know, the brain is not just all about um, cut and dry, like get the job done, but it just has a part that like responds to beauty. Um, so here's a few ideas of kind of using some of that sensory stuff. You know, you can make this squiggly path um, where you can have them hop over it. You can even get outside and do chalk. Um, you know, these are more for younger kids probably, but your older kids can do things like playing basketball outside, mowing the lawn, getting that deep, um, you know, pushing a, a wheelbarrow if there's jobs to be done. Um, around the house. Uh, but you can use, you know, just things that you have at home. Uh, animal walks are another great thing for some younger kids uh, where it's fun and it feels like play, but it also is giving them that sensory input and helping to benefit that emotional regulation. So this is, I uh, mentioned before about mendability. If you go on YouTube, they have a few um, just like brief videos that are a few minutes long. Um, where you can watch, it's just clips of kind of more famous art along with classical music. And these are something that I think can be great, especially for younger kids, but even for older kids, just kind of on in the background in a transition time um, that maybe you noticed in your day at home or even in the classroom just tends to get a little, a little dysregulated. So I'm only going to play a couple minutes, like a few seconds of this, so you can get the gist of it, but because um, I don't want to use up too much of our time. stop that abruptly, but um, we just for the sake of time, do you need to move on? But hopefully you could see how that might um, kind of transition and help you to um, just kind of help calm the mood or change uh, the overall mood of, of the day. Okay. Um, so other things that help regulate any kind of pattern or rhythmic activity is such a great brain stem calmer. You know, you might know a lot of adults or maybe you yourself who, when they're feeling angry or frustrated or anxious, going for a run is something that is incredibly 
um, positive for them. And that's because that rhythmic pace of your feet hitting the ground, that um, it just speaks to your brainstem. Um, some things you can do with, with kids of all ages playing catch, uh, walking, swinging, a rocking chair, dancing, and then running, like I mentioned. Um, we love on YouTube Seeds Family Worship. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it's a YouTube channel where they have songs that are all specifically scripture. It's great for kids to help them memorize scripture. Um, so a lot of them have motions with it. So a lot of times if my kids just need to like get some wiggles out or, you know, regulate with dancing, Seeds Family Worship will like pop that on the TV. And that can be something that, again, helps shift the mood and shift that towards emotional regulation. Um, especially, excuse me, for younger kids, unstructured play is a wonderful way um, to regulate. Sometimes kids don't need you to actively do something with them or for them, um, but they need to just kind of have that either opportunity to escape or even sometimes to play out and work out stressors. You know, I've seen lots of kids um, with dolls or animals and they're narrating maybe a, a scenario that was stressful to them. Um, and that's a way that a lot of kids can work things out or even just that freedom to almost zone out a little bit um, and play outside or play with dolls or play with blocks or whatever it is that they're interested in can be really beneficial. Um, getting on their level to connect is hugely important, especially for younger kids. Um, so if you could imagine the height difference between maybe in a typical adult and a toddler, and if you had somebody talking to you who was two or three times taller than you, there's like a natural, maybe a little bit of an intimidation factor sometimes with that, but getting down on their level, um, just as a way of offering reassurance and connection can be really helpful. And um, again, kind of going back to giving them space, if they're not in unstructured play, but that message of, it looks like you need some, some room to calm down, I'm here if you need me. Um, I know I worked with um, one child who was around six and she needed like a good 20 minutes. <laughs> but if you just left her alone for 20 minutes and gave her that space and she knew where you were, she would come back a completely different person. So she just needed to have really almost no sensory input for like 20 minutes and could come back completely turned around and ready to go. So that's just kind of an area where it's important to get a chance to know your, know your kids. So I want to talk a little bit about deep breathing, but deep breathing in a way that doesn't feel like you're doing deep breathing, if that makes sense. Um, so, sorry, I just want to check the time. Um, some things that you can do with your kids, especially younger kids, um, it kind of goes from like younger to older if you look at it. So obviously you could do this deep breathing on the hand with a child who was willing, but some kids are a little resistant to feeling like they're, you're making them do deep breathing. Um, so you can have them lay on their belly with a stuffed animal and move the stuffed animal up and down. And so what that's going to promote is getting that deep belly breathing, that deeper oxygen, um, oxygenation for them. You can have them blow up a balloon, blow bubbles or a pinwheel, um, use a straw. My kids like to use a straw and race puff balls across the floor. Um, so that makes it just something fun, but then it also requires them to be taking a deep breath in and a deep breath out without feeling like, do your deep breathing exercises because you're dysregulated right now. Um, another fun thing for younger kids is filling up a cup with uh, water and some dish soap and then using a straw, you just let them blow bubbles and the bubbles just kind of accumulate and overflow out of the thing. And again, it requires that deep breath in and a deep breath out without feeling like you're doing deep breathing. Um, for older kids, you can have them put maybe five or 10 pieces of paper on a table and see if they can spin it around the table. So blowing on the edges and turn the, the stack of papers a full 360. You can continue to make it harder, add another five or 10 pieces of paper, or even you know rip up paper onto a plate and have them blow them all off. Um, those are just some activities that can get kids into the mindset of doing deep breathing without feeling like they're doing that exercise. Another thing that some kids I've worked with have enjoyed is smelling a birthday cake and then blowing out the candles. So we talk about what kind of birthday cake do you want this time? Oh, I'm gonna have chocolate with chocolate icing. So we're gonna smell that chocolate cake and then we're gonna blow out the birthday candles. 
And so even something like that can feel a little more, um, a little more fun and a little less like an exercise they're forced to do. Okay, um, so the next thing is attunement. Um, so attunement is really kind of being able to have that emotional um, connectedness as a caregiver, as even a teacher or professional in a child's life. Um, we reach that attunement by taking their perspective, both physically and emotionally. And so, you know, it starts from um, even in an infant having that eye connection where an infant will look you in the face and coo and giggle at you and then you respond. And then moving up through preschool where maybe they're pointing things out to you and you're responding or you're naming things, you know, maybe as you're walking through the grocery store with them. Oh, look, there's bananas. Just, you love bananas. You have one this morning. Um, and then as they get older, it's more about, hey, you know, that looked like a hard day yesterday. Can you tell me about what that was like? And then reflecting back what they what they just told you. Oh, so what I'm hearing you say is that, you know, you had some friends that um, kind of left you out last week, last week, and that really didn't feel good. Um, so just kind of being able to take their perspective and connect with them, and sort of see things the way that they see things, and then again connecting lovingly, um, hugs, praise, telling them what you love about them. Playing together is really huge, and I think in the time when so many of us are much home much more than we usually are, um, taking this opportunity to play with your kids, whatever is meaningful to them, younger kids, you know, building with blocks, um, maybe, you know, a little bit older school age might enjoy Barbies or playing tag outside. Older kids might like video games or playing basketball with them outside. Really whatever is meaningful to your child um, can go a long way. Um, and also we use language to bond. So, you know, maybe we'll talk about what do you want to do today? Or what do you want to do this week? Um, you know, should we bake something? What do you think would be fun? Or what, what are some things that we could do when all of this is over? Um, or maybe talk about a fun memory like, hey, you know, when we went last year on vacation, that was so much fun. Remember when we did this or that? Um, and then being silly. Don't forget to just kind of like lighten things up a little bit and be willing to be silly and have fun with your kids. Um, Another thing, one of the best advice that I've ever been given um, by someone that I really look up to was to give your children a good name to live up to. Um, so you're not the one, they're not the one that's whiny or grumpy or um, obstinate, but instead I'm gonna talk to them all day long about all the things that I see, hear, or observe in the moment that's irrefutable evidence of great things about them. So, you know, I saw you shared the last um, little bit of crackers with your brother. That was so kind. Um, in our house, we really like to try to highlight things that are fruits of the spirit specifically. Um, you know, when you see that was so loving or that was really patient or, you know, to my toddler, you stayed in your bed last night. You really used your self-control and just those little things that you see in that moment that you can't argue was there. Um, and pouring those things into them to kind of give them a good name to live up to is a great way to relate. Um, okay, so again, just this is just a reminder of that good name to live up to, Philippians 4 8. This is a really familiar verse, um, but it kind of struck me a different way in thinking about our kids. So, how do we think about whatever is true, noble, right, pure? lovely and admirable. How do we think and meditate on these things about our kids? I think we spend so much time focused on negative behaviors and not that those things shouldn't be addressed when they need to be or that sin shouldn't be addressed, but to remember how do we focus on the true, noble, right, pure, lovely and admirable things about the kids that God's entrusted us with. Okay, so finally we reach the green brain, which is where we're able to reason. This is really where we're able to problem solve together. So this, you know, we might have that impulse in the midst of a red brain moment where we want to try to think about how we can make this not happen next time. That's not the time. This is the time with green brain. When you see them fully able to be calm and regulated, we can start problem solving. Hey, I noticed earlier this morning you got really frustrated with your math. What can we do differently? Could we break it up in chunks? Could we do it outside? What can we do differently that might help? 
you can reflect back on the situation, ask them how they were feeling, ask them um, what they, you know, saw from the situation. And I think you can share your own emotions and experiences during this time. I think it's important for our kids to know this is hard. It's hard to keep your temper in check and not feel frustrated when you're in the same four walls with people 24 hours a day with very little escape or outlets. <laughs> and I think it's okay to tell your kids that, you know, sometimes mommy needs like to take a break and go upstairs and just kind of make sure my attitude is right. And I, I think it's important for our kids to see that, to see how we're feeling in situations, honestly, see what we do to manage those emotions and how we trust God to change and shape us to be more like him. This is also the moment when you can practice new skills so that they can better access them. So like I said before, with a lot of those red brain activities, you don't have to only do them in the moment when there's a crisis. You can practice them all throughout the day to maintain green brain and also to make sure that they're easier to access in those yellow and red brain moments. Um, in green brain, you can also empower them with new information. So I would really encourage you at whatever level is ap appropriate to share some of this information with your kids. It's important to talk about how our brains work, how God designed us, um, and how to understand what is going on when we feel upset, we feel frustrated or angry. Um, I think a great way to explain to kids and even for us to understand better is to think of red brain as a barking dog or a beeping smoke alarm. So you can use whichever one is more relevant to your kids. Um, you know, a dog is gonna bark and it might bark because an intruder is coming into your house and there really is danger. And that's what red brain is like. But a dog might also bark when a squirrel runs by. And so it's the same reaction, whether it's a squirrel and there's no danger or it's an intruder and there is danger. The same thing with a smoke alarm. You know, the smoke alarm is going to go off when your house is on fire and there is a danger, but it sounds exactly the same when somebody just burnt some toast. So whatever is most meaningful to your child, um, you know, I would share those things. Sometimes our brain sends us messages and makes us feel like everything is wrong and there's a huge danger, but sometimes it's just burnt toast. So being able to know how to manage that, know how to turn the smoke alarm off, know how to soothe your dog and get them to stop barking when it's just a squirrel so that you can kind of get back to regular life without that interruption. And then I think sharing, memorizing, and keeping in view relevant scriptures. Um, you know, any way that we can put scripture up around our homes and just have that constantly be around us and our kids is gonna keep us grounded in God's truth. So these are just a couple of verses, you know, Matthew 6, 26 and 30 about God's provision and care that even the birds of the, of the air and the flowers of the field are cared for and dressed beautifully. So why would we ever worry about anything that we need? Um, Philippians 4, 7, that there's a peace that passes all understanding and that our hearts are guarded by Jesus Christ. John 14, 27, do not let your heart be troubled. And Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing. So these are just some things. There's many, many, many more verses that you could um, explore with your kids, hang up around your house, memorize together, just to be able to encourage one another with the truth of scripture in a time that feels really uncertain and concerning. Um, so I just want to leave you with this, that but part of the reason why I love sharing um, the brain science behind um, so much of behavior and uh, stress is that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I think being empowered both as adults and for kids to understand that God made us a certain way and for certain reasons, and that he also gave us a world full of ways that we can trust him and use him to, um, you know, manage stress and manage the difficulties in our lives. It's really going to enable us um, to praise him more fully because we understand ourselves more fully and um, the intricacies that he's created us with and also, you know, live in a way that honors him. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about sharing all this with you. Um, I really do appreciate you again, taking the time to explore some of these um, ideas with me. And I, again, I really hope that there were some practical things that you can take right away and be using this afternoon with your family 
um, or the kids that you're working with in other settings. Uh, so like I promised, here are some of the resources that I used or that I would recommend you to look into if there's things that you want to, um, you know, kind of dig a little deeper with on your own. And then I'm going to stop sharing and we can kind of go to some questions, Gwen, if some things came up. I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I think it's a little tight. Yeah. Um, Sure. Uh, yeah, I've been collecting some questions as we've gone, and I'll just go ahead and pose a couple to you as they sure. have them, and it looks like we're getting a couple of additional as well. I am getting some questions about will the slides or certain uh, visuals that Megan shared be available afterwards. When we send, up the, send out the follow-up email to our webinar today, you'll get both the recording, the link to the recording, and we will include um, some of those visuals as well as the list of resources that Megan put up at the end. So we will make sure that that's available to you. And we encourage you to share, uh, share the link in the resource list with anybody else who you think would be, benefit from the, um, the content that we covered today. Um, so Megan, I'm getting a couple of questions of uh, specific situations and just thought that, that, you know, in terms of all that you covered today, it might be helpful to respond in relation to those. Sure. And the first one is, uh, how much do I tell my three-year-old about COVID-19? And how do I, based on how they, you know, level of their understanding, how do I communicate what uh, without causing fear? Sure. You know, I think um, sometimes we underestimate what our kids absorb uh, just kind of naturally around us. So I think framing it in a way um, that you're comfortable with and having that open communication can be really helpful. You know, you kind of know your child best. You're the expert on your child. Um, but I think explaining to them maybe the basics of it, you know, we're staying home because there's a sickness that's going around um, and we're trying to be, you know, helpful to others to keep our to ourselves. We're washing our hands more. Um, you know, so just kind of the very basics without instilling a lot of fear so that they know what to expect. Um, I think another layer of this that we have to think about too is that so many of our kids are going to be going back to school in the fall and it, if schools are open it's probably going to be very different and so even for kids going into preschool they might see or as we start going out more you might see people with masks on and that could be pretty unnerving to even a three-year-old. So giving kind of a basic understanding of the knowledge they have or asking them what questions they have um, about what's going on kind of opens that dialogue and lets you get a sense of what they've noticed and maybe what their concerns are. And another question, it's uh, kind of within the same world. It's how do you discuss with, um, with kids the, the reality that the future is uncertain and all of these variables are kind of in question um, and just might seem like an overwhelming um, sure. You know, I think there's an element of like our theology that comes into this as well, which is really important. You know, we're, we have the benefit of knowing that we have a sovereign God who is in control of everything. And I think there can be this temptation, especially with younger kids to kind of tell them God is going to take care of everything and everything's going to be fine. You don't have to worry about it. And while that is true, it can kind of give them sort of a false sense of security and thinking that God is taking care of everything means nothing bad or hard is ever going to happen. And then when that does happen, there, you know, we have kids that are adolescents or, um, you know, young adults that their very foundational core is being shaken because their understanding of God was that he wasn't ever going to let anything bad happen to us. And so I think being able to share maybe stories from scripture that they're comfortable with or familiar with um, and helping them understand, you know, here's Daniel. He was in a really scary situation and, but God protected him and helped him. And so knowing that God's in control, that even when bad or scary things happen to us or things that we don't want to happen, that we know that God is still good and that he does everything to make us more like him, more like Jesus. And so maybe just kind of framing things from that perspective um, can help, you know, and again, at an age appropriate level, build that understanding of who God is and how we can trust him, but that trust in him doesn't mean nothing bad is ever going to happen. It means that God sometimes uses hard things in our lives to make us more like him. Another question is, how do parents recognize depression or depression anxiety in, in their students? And are there specific coping, 
uh, mechanisms related to depression that you could share? Sure. Depressions in uh, depression in um, like middle school and high school kids, a lot of times looks a lot more like agitation. Um, so you might see some of those classic depression signs where they're more withdrawn um, or sad or sleeping a lot um, or kind of giving up things that they previously enjoyed. But you also might just see a lot of irritability and agitation. Um, so those are some things to keep in mind too. Uh, you know, if you're concerned about your child, I would encourage you to reach out to a professional. There's lots um, of resources available uh, online where you can do video sessions. And I think a lot of professionals have really been trying to make themselves available in new ways through this time. But if you have concerns, you know, you can reach out to your doctor or you can reach out to a professional. It looks like we're right up against two o'clock. So at this point, I think it's we're going to wrap up. I do want to say thank you, Megan, uh, for your time today. And to let you all know that Karen is planning on offering additional resources like this webinar in the coming weeks and hoping to roll different ones out throughout the summer. So you'll receive a follow me email from us in the next day or so with the recording from today's webinar, as well as the list of resources and visuals that uh, Megan has mentioned and shared. Um, and we do encourage you to share this resource with, uh, with others you think would benefit. Uh, before we transition off though, I did want to put in a quick little plug that we are launching a online Master of Social Work program this fall. It's going to be a fully online program geared towards preparing advanced level social workers for grace driven and relationship based practice with individuals and families. Um, and Megan is actually one of our faculty members in the program. So if you want to learn about the MSW program, or if uh, you might be interested in any of our other graduate programs or continuing education opportunities, uh, I encourage you to visit our website to learn more, or you can email just admissions at karen.edu to speak with one of our counselors. We are so grateful that you were able to join us today for the webinar. Um, we hope this time has been helpful for you. Uh, we look forward to having you join us in the future. And at this point, I'm going to say, Thank you. It's a pleasure uh, participating with you today, and we hope that you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.